the probable cause to search uh, may there may be other um, sources, other uh, people that have come forward that have given information uh, that are in there that could be at risk. Welcome to the global phenomenon: surviving the survivor, where we're all just trying to survive in a rough world. What's up, STS Nation? Welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, where we make the promise to bring you the best guests in true crime. And today is no exception. You're in for a double delight uh, when you see who the guests are. Uh, It has been two months and four days since four young University of Idaho students were savagely murdered, stabbed to death in their off-campus home. As you know, I like to start by remembering the victims' names, so let us never forget those young lives lost way too soon. Madison Mogan, 21, Kaylee Gonzalez, 21, Zana Kernodal, 20, and Ethan Chapin, 20. May their memories all be a blessing. Police say they think the killer is 28-year-old Brian Christopher Kober, Koberger. We want to remind everyone that Brian Koberger is presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. And now, our best guest breakdown. Uh, The gentleman we have not had on the show before is Mr. Greg McCrary. He entered on duty as a special agent with the FBI back on December 1st, 1969, when I was five months old. (laughs) He's been associated with the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime since its uh, inception in 1985. He has provided expert witness testimony in homicide and rape trials in North America and Europe, and he's authored numerous publications, including The Unknown Darkness, Profiling the Predators Among Us. He wrote that with Dr. Catherine Ramsland, who's been a guest on the show and, of course, of course taught Brian Koberger and was a contributing author to the FBI's Crime Classification Manual. The other gentleman is a familiar face and a friend of the show, Detective Sergeant Chris Anderson, a retired Birmingham Police Department veteran with 27 years of experience in law enforcement. The detective also co-hosted Investigation Discoveries series Reasonable Doubt and previously solved crimes on air for Annie's First 48 Birmingham. He's also host of the Crime and Cookie Juice podcast, Check It Out, and author of the upcoming book, The Case. Uh, Real quick programming notes, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Patreon. On uh, Twitter, we're at Podcast STS. And as my eight-year-old daughter always says, hit that subscribe and like button. It gets the algorithm chugging. Um, Agent McCrary, to you first. First day back at school at the University of Idaho today. Uh, Students were quoted as saying they're in better spirits. They're comfortable on campus. Uh, Others say the school will never be the same. What are your thoughts on the fact that there is a a collective sigh of relief, but still uh, the university is scarred? Yeah, I think the mixed emotions would be something to be anticipated for sure. Uh, This is a deep wound, and it's not going to go away, um, probably for the duration that those students are there. uh, As long as they're there and they remember this, it's going to be an issue, but it should diminish uh, over time. So um, that that seems like a very uh, understandable position. Degree of relief, there's been an arrest. The case looks pretty good. We can get into that. Um, But still some trauma and, uh, you know, some concern on that. So that sounds sounds about right. Um, Detective Sergeant Chris Anderson, um, one student said it was really depressing the first week that the murder happened, that the news broke, um, and then went on to say, we all looked at each other and thought, well, they got somebody who they think it is, and uh, we breathed a sigh of relief. I'm pretty sure my mom did the same thing. You are currently the chief of police at a university. Um, It's got to be a major burden lifted off the shoulders of uh, parents whose uh, kids obviously go to the school, right? Absolutely. I'm I'm, I'm positive that those parents are still concerned about the safety of their children. I mean, I'm a father. We're all fathers here. I'm sure that uh, we would feel the exact same thing if something like this had occurred on our children's college campus or anywhere near our children. So yeah, I'm sure that they are breathing maybe a sigh of release, but as a parent, you're still not comfortable, but you have to let your children, you know, you have to let them grow. 
them, but I'm sure they're not comfortable with everything that's happened. Asia McCrary, uh, you're a, you're a, a bona fide legend in the law enforcement world. Uh, what got, what piqued your interest initially? How did you get into the FBI back in 1969? Thanks for that. I try to keep the bar of expectation low though. So, uh, <laughs> Um, after I met, uh, I was out of college, I was teaching, and I met an agent, and he began to recruit me, and I thought, well, I'm not sure what the FBI would want with me, but it sounds kind of cool, so um, I went ahead and uh, applied. It was then what it is now. There's a uh, minimum three-year commitment. If they take you as an agent, uh, you owe them three years. I guess that's the break-even point for them um, based on the time and money they put in You know, working your background and, and that sort of thing. So I figured, well, I can do anything for three years. If I don't like it, I'll, I'll move along and do something else. But instead of quitting after three years, I quit after over 25. So it turned <laughs> into uh, uh, a career uh, for me and uh, one, I, uh, one I enjoyed. And then you went on to teach, and I know you're interested in the psychology uh, of criminals. Right. Um we're going to get into that. We're going to dig into that a, a little bit deeper. But I know, uh, and I hope I'm not uh, giving away any any secrets here, but you and Chris were talking a, a little bit right before the show, and uh, both of you were kind of saying it's impossible to retire from law enforcement. What What is it uh, in your bones that uh, keeps you so interested? Uh, I can do the math because I'm almost 54, and you started about that long ago. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um it, it, it's more than a job. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's becomes who you are. Uh, and it's a core identity that, that, uh, that you have. Um, I still consult on cases. I still do expert testimony. I've got a trial coming up, um, uh, this month. Uh, I've got a report due in federal court out in Chicago <laughs> soon. So I'm still in the, uh, still in the mix. It's just, it's just kind of who you are. And, uh, um, it, it's just difficult to let go. And, and that's why you look uh, great and, uh, you know, your passion keeps you young. Uh, Chris, do you feel the same way? Absolutely. I, I don't, uh, you know, I, 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 I tried retiring uh, when I left First 48. I'm sorry, when I left Birmingham Police Department, just after the First 48. And I tried retiring and, and just doing television. But I always, it, it's, it's kind of one of those things that just keeps drawing you back in. If you if you become a part of this, this because it, it's more than just a job, you know, it's 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 your mission. It becomes a ministry for you almost, you know, and you just can't let go of ministry, uh, especially if you know that you are there for a much higher purpose than just to pull a paycheck. Because the guys that just come into law enforcement just to pull a paycheck, they never survive. They never mm -hmm. survive. So, yeah, once you once you've done so many years into it, you think you want to retire and, and, and you'll sit down. You may sit down for a couple of months. But you'll you'll go right back. Something something will happen. You you'll get right back into it, and you know it's just it's just a cycle. And for for guys like me, and for guys like Greg, we love it. Yeah. Every everyone in news says it's like a bad marriage you just can't get out of. And I'm the same way. I'm I'm addicted to news. Um, right. you know, I'm always looking to see if something's broke. You know, if there's anything breaking on these stories and. Uh, but pa passions are good, even though they can uh, wear you down a little bit. Mm -hmm. But moving back on to uh, the story out of uh, Moscow, Idaho, uh, and Agent uh, McCrary, I'll, I'll toss it back to you. So we heard from uh, the father of Maddie Mogan. Uh, he was on Good Morning America uh, with a smile on his face, uh, which was good to see. Uh, but he admitted um, that he has not been able to read the uh, probable cost affidavit. Uh, and doesn't know if he'll be able to, he started to read it, but couldn't finish it. Uh, does any of that surprise you? Because there's some, uh, you know, details in there he probably doesn't want to know. Yeah, uh, it it doesn't. I mean, um, uh, well, we, we mentioned earlier, I guess we're all parents. And uh, <clears throat> I can't imagine um, what it's like to, to lose a uh, child. Uh, for a while, I was on the advisory board of a group called the Parents of Murdered Children. And um, uh, uh, again, even though I've dealt with that and dealt with the, and the parents are certainly the vicarious victims uh, of crimes like this, but the emotional trauma, it's something um, uh, I don't think I can really appreciate, uh, uh, even though I've been around it a lot, uh, when it's your child. So it wouldn't surprise me 
that he has difficulty getting into the nitty gritty of this, getting into the the details as to what one happened, you know, what happened. And even though uh, we've all looked at the uh, the probable cause, there isn't that much in there that would be at least offensive. I think uh, um, at least to those of us, or maybe I'm just getting too callous <laughs> about this stuff. But uh, but you know, once we get into it, once he gets into it, if there's a trial and you have to get into the the actual nature of the crime and all that, that that can be very traumatic. And uh, Detective Sergeant, have you come across that where, you know, you're working a case and there is a probable cause affidavit? Do you, do you try to cushion the blow uh, for, you know, victims' families? Do you try to shield them a little bit? Yeah, as much as possible. You know, as you you being the investigator, you, you should be that shield for your families and your victims' families. You know, uh, there are times where there have been cases where we've had to make an identification. And I try not to make, you know, say if you have a, a person who someone says that this may be the person that you're looking for, or, you know, this may be, we'll just make up a name. This may be Carol. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, okay. So, yeah, maybe, you know, it's that, it's that one person and this, that somebody, you have to have this person identified. Well, you never want to show a parent a, a, a photograph of a deceased, of their deceased child, because that, that image is burned into their memory for the rest of their lives. They'll never forget about it. So, you know, as an investigator, I was always, I always tried to be that shield for my, my, my family members. Uh, I would mm -hmm. try to find somebody else that could, could do it. That was not so close to the mother and father, because you never want to burn that image into a loved one's face. They never forget it. So there is, um, some meaty uh, news uh, today that I want to sort of dissect with both of you. And that has to do with a sealed warrant. Um, authorities have temporarily sealed the search warrant for uh, Koberger's Pullman, Washington apartment. Um, they claim that releasing details could, and I quote here, prematurely end the investigation and I quote, create a threat to public safety. That has raised some antennae. Um, Agent McCrary, does it for you? What What do you make of this? Yeah, I was unaware of that, but um, yeah, the probable cause to search uh, may there may be other um, sources, other uh, people that have come forward that have given information uh, that are in there that could be at risk uh, from blowback from you know from other people. Um, sources and method, methods are obviously the things we want to protect. Uh, always, you know, in a case like this. And uh, so, you know, whatever is in there, there's some reason to, uh, you know, obviously they feel to maintain, uh, to keep that sealed at this point, but eventually it'll all come out. I mean, once this gets into trial, if we, if we get to a trial, all of this will be, you know, a matter of public record and I'll have to produce that and that'll be, that'll be open. And then we'll get a much better idea of, of uh, you know, of what's in there. But uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's obviously something in there they want to protect. And with your uh, five decades of experience, so what's your hunch? Will there be a trial in this case? Uh, it, it's difficult to say right now. I think the I think the case is strong, so I can't see the prosecutors buckling and you know caving in. The only thing I could see is maybe taking the death penalty off the table uh, if he goes for life. Uh, you know, if he pleads and agrees to life without parole maybe they would consider taking the death penalty off, but I can't see anything, anything more than uh, that. And then, then again, sort of back to the consideration that would make it easier on the victim's families uh, that they wouldn't have to sit through a trial, uh, you know, to a degree. Um, but then some people might, might not be happy that there wasn't a trial. So it, you know, it can cut both, both ways, but um, you know, I think that'd be the only way I would, could see a trial not happening. Uh, is it, they they just took the death penalty off the table. That'd be it. And I know you're not an attorney, but while we're on the subject, it's come up a bunch of times. What about a change of venue? Or do you think they uh, leave it in the county where this crime happened, Latah County? Well, I, I certainly think the defense will want to get it out of there, but I I, I, I would think it would stay. Um, that w of course, we'll have to see as it, you know, as it goes, but uh, I think it'll probably stay there. So back to the sealed warrant, um, it is going to remain that way, uh, authorities say, till at least March 1st. But uh, Detective Sergeant Anderson, to you, uh, some of the language uh, 
has people talking um, as almost everything gets people talking. And I don't think it's mm-hmm. hyperbole to say that this case has captured global attention because I see it myself. I'm getting comments and, and emails from Norway, from Germany, from, from all over Australia, South Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, but the language, a threat to public safety, that's one uh, piece of the verbiage. And then they go on to say, and a threat to the privacy of witnesses, victims, and victim families' names in the affidavit. Um, do you read anything into this? Um, it, it sounds like there's something that could potentially be dangerous. Right. I, I, I try not to, to read too much into it, but I, I do believe that there's something in that, that house or something within that search warrant that has been found that could be detrimental to the case. And because of the national attention, that as much attention as this case has gotten, I think that it is probably the smartest idea uh, to try to keep as much information to, close to the vest as you can until it's time to be released. Because by law, it's going to have to be released. Yeah, they'll, the, the defense attorneys will, by law, they have to have every single e- piece of evidence that was found in this case, and they'll get it. So, uh, but I'm one of those investigators that believes that there's a lot more out there in this case. Uh, I don't think it's a slam dunk because I've not heard. I, I, maybe I'm, I'm I've missed this portion of the evidence. I've not heard of what kind of DNA evidence they found because there are <laughs> there are se- there are several different types of DNA that they could have found. It could be touch DNA. Blood DNA is, is will be extremely hard for the defense to overcome. Extremely hard. And and that's I fully expect that it is blood DNA. But if it's touch DNA, then I, I, I it they have a much better chance of this case going to trial because touch DNA is so much easier than blood to transfer. It's much easier. And I think we as the public, when we hear DNA, we've gotten to a point that we think, oh, it's a slam dunk case when that is not the case by no means. So once we we get a sense of uh, what information that the investigators have in the case, what type of evidence that they have, I think we can make a better determination as to how far this case will go. Because like I said, there are, all DNA is not created equal. It, it's, it's not. And, you know, it's going to be the science that, 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 that determines the outcome of this case. But I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Yeah, let me jump in on that if I could. I, I totally agree that if it's touch DNA, if the DNA on the knife case is just touch DNA, you could certainly see a defense uh, attorney arguing, well, uh, Mr. Koberger touched that sheaf, but it belongs to the killer, not him. And that's how it got there. He wasn't there. He just happened mm-hmm. to touch that someplace else. And uh, th- that whole idea of reasonable doubt. But I totally agree. If it's blood, well, you just don't leave your blood around. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, that's right. much more, uh, much more compelling. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Type of and, de- and depending on where they find it also, because we've yeah. not heard exactly where it's found. So that, there's a lot more information that's in yeah. the, that, that's being yeah. held within this case that uh, will we'll determine how far it goes. I agree. Absolutely yeah. agree. I may and, uh, speculate just, just a bit on that, 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 um, um, we don't know, but I've had cases like this uh, that I've been involved in in the past where there's been multiple victims at a scene where they've been stabbed and the offender has cut himself and his blood is at the scene. And it, we don't know if that happened here or not, but if it did, then that's a real tight case. If his blood is there at the scene mixed in with victim's blood, that's very, very compelling um, if that, if that's, you know, what they have, but again, we don't know. We only know about the, uh, uh DNA on the knife, uh, uh, case at this point. So we'll, we'll just have to see how it plays out. Agent McCrary, uh, did you ever have a quadruple stabbing in your career that was, that was fatal? Uh, a triple is the closest I've, I've had. Um, yeah, that was a family, a mother and two daughters up in Rhode Island, um, were stabbed to death uh, in in one one scene. That's that's I've never had a uh, uh, a quadruple stabbing though, no. which again goes to show how unusual it is. Um, back to this sealed warrant. Um, I'm just curious, and I'm definitely um, wading into murky waters that I shouldn't be. But hypothetically, and I said hypothetically for everyone watching, could it be something like 
uh, maybe a hit list he had of other victims and they just don't want to scare the public. Could it be something like that, Agent McCrary? Yeah, it could be. I mean, it, it, it could be, you know, who knows what it is. But they also mentioned about, um, uh, and uh, just going off what, what I heard you say, like other witnesses or yeah, people. Pri like privacy that. of witnesses, victims, right. and victims' families' names. Right, right. There may be witnesses, uh, well, there are witnesses who've come forward, provided information um, to protect them from... Uh, if nothing else, um, you know, uh, paparazzi or the crazy press going on with this or uh, or just this will attract a lot of wacko people as well. And so uh, uh, mm -hmm. to protect them from, you know, any any potential problem, it's it's uh, prudent, I think, to uh, keep it sealed at this point. And uh, the detective sergeant mentioned he does not think this is a slam dunk case. In your experience, is there such a thing as a slam dunk case? And is this one? It's not, it's, I think it's a strong case circumstantially based on what I've seen, but it's certainly not a slam dunk. What will happen in, in, in the, if this thing goes to trial, I mean, what, what will happen? Again, I'm not an attorney, but I've been involved in enough trials to, to, to kind of know how they unfold. The defense will try to separate each piece of evidence uh, from every other piece, put it in its own bucket and discredit, try to discredit each one whether it's the cell phone uh, information, whether it's the white uh, Elantra, uh, whether it's the DNA, each one of those things are going to separate and try and break down. The prosecution, on the other hand, is going to try to put that all together and look at the totality of the evidence. In other words, they're going to say, okay, here's where the white Elantra was seen, but look at when his cell phone was pinging off those towers right there where the car was. And even though we don't have his license plate, what are the chances there's a car without another front license plate uh, in that area with his cell phone pinging and it's not him? So they're going to try to put the whole uh, the whole thing together as totality of the circumstances where the defense will try to break it apart and, and bring up doubts about every piece of it. And so we're always looking at uh, the most current news. Um, the New York Post today, which has actually been doing quite a bit of reporting, spoke to some uh, classmates of uh, Brian Koberger's, um, and they say that he came across as both outgoing and off-putting, um, including one who described him as an insomniac who ran his garbage disposal at odd hours. Um, Agent McCrary, to you, um, if there is a trial, um, are there going to be character witnesses to speak to, you know, the kind of person he is? Uh, possibly maybe more during a sentencing phase. Uh, it, you know, it, it'll depend, but I think what's important here, uh, is, um, I mean, and there could be to show kind of a pattern. And what I'm talking about is there are reports from Pennsylvania about him saying really inappropriate things to, uh, waitresses and customers at a, at a pub or a brewery around where he was going to, to college there at the sale. <laughs> Um, and so much so that it was, you know, logged in on the, uh, um, you know, the information by the owners of this pub to keep an eye on this guy. So uh, I think that's that's partly what we're dealing with. Again, I may be getting a little bit into motive, which we really don't know for sure. But um, th th this is an individual who's had problems dealing with females saying inappropriate things. Uh, being off-putting and uh, that sort of thing. So that sort of information could get uh, brought in, um, you know, at some point to show a, show a pattern. And they may have more information about this that, again, that we don't know because they've held so much so close, which is the right thing to do. And just to, you know, round out a little bit of, uh, you know, the flavor that these students were offering about Brian Koberger, one student <laughs> said, uh, he asked me what I was studying, where I'm from. He would just make friendly small talk. Um, and uh, another student said nothing suspicious ever, ever, and 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 stress that. Uh, Detective Sergeant Chris Anderson, um, does it surprise you at all that some students say, hey, this guy seemed perfectly normal? I mean, can evil be lurking in what appears to be a normal human being? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It can it can give the appearance of a normal person at at any point in time in his life. I mean, most serial killers, you a good portion of the serial killers, you'll find that they're they're kind of 
loaners and they can operate within the public as normal as any other person, but you know that there's a terror or a horrific person that lies underneath. So yeah, we, we I've heard that multiple occasions on multiple, uh, a, a lot of the cases that I've worked, you know, we in the public, because we are uh, reasonable people, we think that because this person has this instinct to kill that they can't operate. They shouldn't operate like you and I would on a normal basis. But the latter of it is really the truth. Any person is has the capability of uh, committing the most heinous act against another human being. You just have to put them in the right situation in order for them to act on it. Uh, so that means that serial killers within themselves, they can operate as what would seem to be perfectly fine human beings and still have this mm -hmm. this demon with inside of them. Yeah. Yeah, one of the seminal books or works on psychopathy or psychopaths uh, written by a, a doctor years ago, Dr. Uh, Dr. Cleckley, his book was titled The Mask of Sanity. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what we're talking about. They have a mask of sanity that, that they are able to carry off and and uh, it's kind of impenetrable to a degree. They they just appear normal when, in fact, there's a lot of psychopathology uh, and toxicity underneath that. But they 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 appeal appear normal most of the time. Agent McCurry, I've asked uh, the detective about this, but I'm curious. Mm -hmm. I'm always intrigued by this. Um, you must have a very heightened uh, sense of situational awareness when you're walking around. Uh, a mall or go to a restaurant are are you are you always looking out for the bad guys i i it's just become second nature after a while i think you're just you're always looking at the room you're looking at the area um you just you're looking for a vibe um, um before you can settle in you know and, be, and get a little bit more comfortable but you you are it's just who you are i i think it just comes it just comes with the territory <laughs> Sorry we're, li that, man. we're live baby that's all good <laughs> by the way if i was going to cast a movie with you two starring in it definitely for whitaker for chris anderson i i think maybe john malkovich for uh <laughs> agent mccrary i think we couldn't get denzel washington to play me I think I think I'm over Denzel. <laughs> He's with you on another movie, um, right? Probably. So, Agent McCrary, this is what's sort of uh, your wheelhouse too, in terms of uh, psychology. Um, mm -hmm. And I I thought this was the interesting part. This student went on a different one to say he talked to everybody. He was a very chatty person, not charming but outgoing. And then another student said, or this is actually a receptionist at a local medical office said that. Koberger is one of just a few students who kept their appointments, and this was after the killings. What does that say about him if, in fact, he committed these heinous crimes? Uh, I think he was, if, if this is him, uh, that he was um, trying to maintain his normal schedule. He may have been rigid. He may have may appeared um, a, a little bit uptight, more so than normal, but trying very, very hard to keep his routine so that he didn't look uh, suspicious. I think he was trying to do some things. I mean, we see that he re-registered his car uh, and, and did a few things that looked like he may be trying to, to make a couple of moves, um, especially once this came out about the white Elantra. Um, I think, you know, he may be doing some things there, but he didn't want to bolt town. <clears throat> he wanted to finish out the semester and, and maintain as much normalcy as he could. But I think he would have been a little more rigid, a little more over-controlled than he had been uh, prior to this. So, uh, Detective uh, Anderson, we've had some time to digest this story of, of what we do know. Um, have you given any more thought? The, the obvious question still is three letters, why? Have you given any more thought to motive? And then I'll get Agent Mitt. Uh, McCrary's take on that? You know, as a homicide investigator, you, you never, you, you never can, can really figure out why people kill. Uh, most, most folks would think that, you know, investigators go in and want to answer the why, because it makes it much easier to tell the story. Absolutely. But, you know, that, that, 
finding out the why that is the hardest portion of a uh, of an investigation finding out why this person did this to this person it, it's it's just too hard it's too much of a, a of a a, a and I, I hate to put it like this but i mean it's the only way um uh that i can you know it's, it's it's much too hard of a task to ask a homicide investigator you know you you in order to find out why this happened you you need to figure out who did it and how it and and how it happened but why it happened is is way it's way too hard and and you know it's not one of the standards of proof that's that's required by a homicide investigator uh, or by a, a, a defense uh, i'm sorry a prosecutor Chris gave me that look that you give to the stupid guys in the media that ask dumb no. questions. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's not. It's not. It's really not. I mean, it's actually a very good question because, uh, look, I think television has had something to to do with this, and maybe maybe because I'm a I'm a former television personality that I did too. But finding out why homicides happen, it is extremely extremely hard, and that the majority of my cases. I still question the whys. The majority of the, and I've worked over 300 homicide cases. I still question the whys on, on the majority of those cases. Have you ever had a, a suspect um, tell you, I, I did it just because I enjoyed it. It was a thrill kill. Have you had that experience? Yeah. So we, um, we talked about how many, uh, what was the highest number of victims you've had in one crime scene? I think Greg said he had three. Uh, I've had, a homicide, a stabbing homicide with five victims, uh, two adults, the others were children. The suspect in that case um, did confess to me and my partner on why he did it. He, and, and it ended up he had some serious mental instabilities uh, involved in, in, in with him, but uh, he, he told us that it was it was because he heard, and you know, his answer was he heard the voices. I think that he was setting up his his defense when he said it, but he said that he, it was because of he heard the voices. He just told they, he told the voices told him that his family was about to kill him, so he acted first. So, I mean, it's happened on multiple occasions where guys will tell you exactly why they did it. I had one guy that beat a child to death uh, that he was babysitting. And he did it because in his mind, he was disciplining the child. Uh, but, you know, he, he, he did some, some terrible things to this child. I won't say it on your show, but terrible, terrible things. Uh, and in the name of disciplining the child. So yeah, how do you had, keep your, how, how, I'm sorry, Adrian McCray, but how do you, you're talking about three kids that are stabbed to death. How do you, how is it possible to compartmentalize that, keep your emotions out of it and not want to, do some harm to this guy? Um, well, you have to, because if you um, let your emotions um, control you, you're not going to survive in the job very long. Uh, you're dealing with all these things. Um, you have to be able to, to compartmentalize um, this. Otherwise, it, it'll d destroy you. Uh, talk to the new agents coming in and the uh, behavioral science unit down at Quantico and even the new agents in general. Um, but especially the work we did um, down there with the serial murders and sexual homicides and all that. It's toxic. Uh, the material is toxic. Um, uh, homicide, rape, any of that violent crime is toxic. And it'll poison you over time if you let it. So you have to uh, be able to separate yourself from, uh, from the work. Uh, and I, I think Chris probably has seen it. I've seen it. You see some old guys, uh, retired guys who are mean and uh, and sad and angry, and they don't even like themselves anymore. Uh, uh, you don't want that to happen. So you've got to be able to separate that out and, and protect yourself from, you know, from that happening. Um, as far as motive, uh, you know, it's interesting because the, the research that we were doing uh, when I was assigned to be able to science you to going in, interviewing the killers, serial murderers, child killers, rapists, you know, you know, whomever, uh, uh, Chris brought up a, a case of a guy who at least sounded psychotic, uh, had command hallucinations, voices were telling him to do it. That's one kind. And let's assume it's real because there are people who are mm -hmm. psychotic who commit crimes, but they're the minority. Um, the, the people who commit most violent crimes are not mentally ill. They're mentally disordered. They're not normal in, in that way, but they know what they're doing is wrong. 
but they do it anyway. Uh, the psychotic person may not appreciate the wrongfulness of what they've done uh, because they are mentally ill, but most of these guys uh, do. But to get the motive, just for a minute, um, we talk about like a motive as though it's a singular thing. It's usually a mix of things with one motive more dominant than, you know, than another uh, motive. Uh, and even these guys sometimes don't really know why, why they did it. I was involved in a serial murder case. Um, we finally uh, got the guy, the detectives are, you know, asking him and they get into this and he, why is he killing these women? And his answer was, well, um, just taking care of business. That's it. Just taking care of business. And um, that was, that was his motive. I mean, he just thought these women needed to be killed and, um, you know, which was, was just taking care of it. Now, in this case, obviously we don't know, uh, you know, at this point what it, you know, what it was. And, you know, it could be speculative, but I think it's fair to say this was not a random act of violence. He just didn't pick this house at random, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and go in there that they were targeted for some reason. And especially when we see the stalking that a, a, appeared to have occurred in the months prior to this, that he was planning this thing. And this is, uh, you know, another way to think about this. It's um, when we talk about violence, it can be kind of broken down along a continuum. There's affective violence, which is uh, impulsive, reactive. It's very defensive. The person is reacting to some imminent threat or some insult uh, that's uh, you know, caused, and there's a lot of anger and rage. But that's, not, that's the most common type of violence, road rage or something like somebody gets pissed off and punches somebody. This is not it. This is predatory violence, which is the opposite. It's not defensive. It's offensive. Um, there's an emo a lack of uh, any emotion to this thing. There's no imminent threat. The victim presents no imminent threat to the danger of the sa no danger to the safety of the the offender at all. They're they're totally defenseless, and uh, he goes in and kills him. So it's cold. It's predatory. It's planned. It's purposeful, and that's that's what we have in this case. So he targeted them for some reason, um, and I do we don't really know what that may be. Uh, it could be an incel kind of a thing that maybe, you know, the uh, involuntary celibate guys who, you know, you know, to be honest, can't get laid and it's not their fault. So they go kill the women. Um, uh, or it could be that maybe he had an encounter with them and they dissed him uh, in some way in a bar or something. And uh, being this narcissistic guy he is, he couldn't get over that and decided that he had to get even. Now, I'm kind of speculating because we don't know this, but something happened that made him target those uh, those women. And it wasn't just a random act of uh, violence. You just didn't pick that house at random and go in. Um, one other piece of uh, timely news. Uh, this will come out uh, just before Koberger is due back in court on Thursday. Uh, yeah. neither, neither of you are attorneys, but you've both been around uh, the block many times. Uh, Chris Anderson, what are you expecting uh, tomorrow in court? You know, I, I'm expecting a, uh, yeah, a, a, a a huge argument from his defense team um, and, and, you know, saying that they won't be able to put up a, a, an adequate defense for him uh, if they're not privy to the information that they're finding in this case. Um you know, in, in, and in these cases, you know, you, you never you never know what you'll see in these cases. So uh, I, it'll be very interesting to see. I'm, I'm 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 hoping that they'll be able to, you know, release a little bit more information about the evidence that they found uh, that that they can release. So I, I'm, I'm you know, I don't know what to expect tomorrow. And one thing that I've never never uh, uh, been able to decipher is what will happen in a court case, because in a homicide case, especially one such as this, you you should be open to hearing anything. Adrian McCrary. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think the defense is going to say, hey, we don't know anything. We can't prepare a defense. We don't we're unable to to do our job until we get more information. The government has all this information. We don't have any, um, you know, we, we, we want to delay, you know, we, 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 mm -hmm. we, we need all this time. And there's some, there, there's some legitimacy to the argument there. They don't have the information. So, um, you know, I think you're going to see arguments like uh, that. 
I don't think they're going to be successful if they're trying to um, talk about a bail reduction or get them out or anything like that. That's not going to fly. But um, again, I don't know if they'd try that or not, but, uh, um, but, but it's going to be something like that. But I agree with Chris. You never know. You just have to see which, you know, what happens. So we'll all be tuned in to, uh, you know, to take a look and see what does happen. As the uh, son of a shrink and the son of a social worker here, I'm always intrigued by the psychological aspect of all this. I, I'm sure you know uh, Dr. Ann Burgess pretty well, Agent McCrary. We've had her on the show a few times. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. There's some interesting things that came up, uh, writings from Brian Koberger uh, from the ages of 14 to 17. Um, the thumbnail for this episode is actually him with that blank stare that we see in, in one of the mug shots. Uh, the title is I am just a blank soul. Those words came from him. Uh, according to these writings, I want to give a, a acknowledgement to the podcast um, hidden, a true crime podcast. They broke this story. Uh, very fascinating stuff. But um, what do you make? And, and we'll go through a couple of the things that he wrote, but just the fact that he referred to himself, uh, at this tender age as being a blank soul. I'm paraphrasing that one. The others will be more direct quotes, but just to hear that from such a young person. Yeah, um, uh, again, uh, in, uh, I, I use psychological terms sparingly or carefully because they're prone to misunderstanding. You know, for example, we talk about, you know, psychopath or psychotic. I mean, they sound similar, but they're they're really quite different. and. You know, sometimes you see in the media, you know, psycho killer. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything, you know, really. But uh, what we know about the development of, uh, when I talk about a psychopath, I'm talking about a person who's not mentally ill in the sense they're delusional and they they don't know what they're doing, but they they lack uh, empathy. Uh, they lack emotion. Um, they don't care about other people. They They see other people have these reactions and they don't. And I'm wondering if that's what he's talking about uh, when he's making statements like this, that, that, that he realizes he's not having the same uh, experiences that other people are having when they're talking about uh, empathy or caring or compassion or concern uh, for other people. So I wonder if, the, and it, it's about that age um, that, that all of this begins to, to come about. So I wonder if that isn't... Uh, uh, you know, what he might be dealing with or self-reflection he's having about that. Uh, Detective Sergeant, this was all um, written about on a website called Tapa Talk. Um, and that's for people who suffer from visual snow syndrome. I'd never heard of it. It's an uncommon neurological condition that affects the way visual information is processed by the brain and eyes. People with the syndrome see many flickering dots like snow or static uh, which must be a horrific way to live. I'm curious, had you heard of it prior to this? No, this has been my very first time hearing about anything like that. I, you know, I've, and I, I don't want to make light of it. I don't know what type of, uh, you know, debilitating or anything that that, that uh, problems these people that are uh, affected with this disease have. But uh, you know, I, I this is this is my first time hearing about anything like that, uh, and I, I don't. You know, I don't see where it is. It some some sort of a keep the, a state that you would be more apt to commit a homicide or anything like that. I, I but it's my first time. I, I'm I'm curious. Now that you've mentioned it, I'm going to go back and look it up myself. Yeah, still never an excuse to commit right. a quadruple homicide if, in fact, he's the person that did commit this Absolutely. horrible crime. Mm -hmm. uh, Agent McCrary, back in 2011, so he was somewhere between the ages and of uh, 14 and 17, he writes that he's been suffering from horrible depersonalization and feels demons in his head are mocking him. And I'll go on a little bit longer here. He writes, as I hug my family, I look into their faces. I see nothing. It is like I'm looking at a video game, but less. I feel less than mentally damaged. It is like I have severe brain damage. Hmm. I am stuck in the depths of my mind where I have to constantly battle my demons, am I here or am I fake? When you hear this, what is your initial reaction? Well, clearly this is a guy with you know some severe personality problems. Again, I'm not going to 
Um, you know, I have a master's degree in psychology, but I'm not a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. I don't pretend to be. I don't, um, you know, offer um, um, thumbnail diagnoses. Uh, but clearly, here, here's a guy with mental problems, mental issues. And, um, you know, he's wrestling, <clears throat> wrestling with these things. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the defense tries to mine a lot of that, <laughs> that, uh, um, uh, you know, to get him maybe, uh, I don't know, is it going to go so far as the NGRI that not guilty by reason of insanity, but uh, it'd be something I think the defense would take a hard look at. And, and the prosecution should as well, just to see, mm -hmm. uh, to see what's there, if anything. And uh, not only do we have the best guests in true crime, we've got the best audience. That is STS Nation. So we're going to get to their questions and comments in a moment if uh, Agent McCrary will indulge us along with Detective Sergeant Chris Anderson. Someone wrote something to me, and it kind of caught my attention. Uh, and it, it had to do with uh, two uh, stops in Indiana on their way back. Um, and a person wrote saying, is it possible – that they took his driver's license to try to get some DNA off of it. Now, the FBI, Agent McCrary, has denied that uh, they had any involvement in it, but you know they might want to not make it public. Is there a chance that that was the reason behind the uh, two stoppages? Uh, I would be surprised. I'm not, I mean, they could look at the driver's license. I'm not sure how they, unless they swabbed it or something, how they'd get any... Uh, um, you know, any sample to, um, uh, you know, to, to look at. I mean, what you typically do, what is, appears to have been done in this case is you, you pull the trash or you follow mm -hmm. a guy around and pick up the cigarette butt or the garbage uh, or the coffee cup or whatever. And I've had cases like that where we've, uh, in, in one case, we had a suspect, he went out to dinner with his wife, detectives bust the table, took the glassware and the silverware and used that, you know, to get the, the DNA. So, I, I don't think that's a likely scenario that they were trying to get DNA off off that. Detective Sergeant. No, I don't. I don't. I agree with Greg. <laughs> I don't think that that was a likely uh, scenario. You know, I, 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 we've had vehicle stops, so I've had people that I suspected may have been involved in some of my homicides stopped by um, law enforcement or patrol officers or whatever. But stopping a person to try to get that DNA off of their driver's license is is it's mm -hmm. almost in, impossible yeah, to right. do you, you just yeah. i mean it's it, yeah. you, just, you can't it, it it's almost impossible right dan abrams who i actually worked for back in the day uh, i heard him on his show say this guy has got to have the worst luck or be the worst driver he's pulled over like four times in a matter of a uh, couple of months not not yeah. unlike my wife actually but let's move on to some uh questions and comments here the first one comes from Feminine energy, and we'll throw this one to you, Agent McCrary. Um, and this is about Koberger and his motive. I feel it's because he envied their life. His shadow self is he wanted to pr prove how smart he was, yet really show the opposite. They, meaning the victims, were everything he always wanted, popular, fun, loved, and living the Greek life at school. Do you agree with any of that? Uh, that could be. And that's kind of what I was touching on earlier about the incel, the involuntary celibate guy who um, um, harbors a resentment towards uh, people who um, are socially engaged and, and are outgoing and in having normal relationships, which they are unable to to have. And that envy and that resentment builds up and, and that's the cause for acting out. So that that certainly could be. We don't know for sure, but it it could be that that type of uh, that type of situation uh, could could play a role in this for sure. Next question for the detective sergeant comes from Gene Brown. We appreciate that you have the best guests, and tonight we're really highlighting that, underscoring it. Um, I'm trying to place myself in the killer's shoes. His return to the house may have been because he did see DM. That is the surviving eyewitness and wanted to take care of her. DM was definitely in danger. So glad she's okay. And I hope she uh, gets any help she needs. Um, detective, you think some people said he wanted to go back to recover the knife sheath. Some say he just wanted to go, you know, kind of get off on the crime scene, which hadn't even happened by the time uh, he went because 911 was called later. 
Do you think he was maybe going to try to finish the job, as this person suggests? Uh, n- neither one of those uh, scenarios uh, uh, could. Uh, I wouldn't eliminate either one of those scenarios, honestly. I mean, you, we've had killers that have returned to the scene to finish off a surviving witness at, on several equi- several occasions. We've also had witnesses who have returned back to the scene of the crime just to marvel in it, to, to marvel at their work, to see law enforcement mm-hmm. working because they are so they have such a such a, 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 a fascination with the act that they uh, that they that they uh, made to happen, that they'll return back just to see what they've done to marvel in it. Like it's just like the uh, the, the person that, that the fire guy, the fireman that sets mm-hmm. fires and then returns back to the scene to put the fire out, you know. It's one of those uh, type situations. It's that type of mindset that we mm. we expect to see in, in in homicide investigations. This next comment is from Mad Seven Fisher, um, Agent McCrary. On the last episode, we talked about why the fascination uh, with true crime, and this is in response to that. I think the fascination is that we've all been scared by this guy, meaning Koberger, reminded again that horror can walk among us in plain sight. We need to know why he did this. I think if we feel like we understand that, we'll have some control. Is there some truth to what this person is saying? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, I, I think I see it, and I uh, ask Chris to jump in on this too. I've seen it within law enforcement. In other words, we study anytime a, an officer gets killed or an agent gets killed, we'll evaluate that as we should to see what happened and how it went wrong. And then we feel better because we'll say, well, I would never do that. Or I know how to avoid that situation. So we get a, um, we learn from it, but we, we get a sense of safety. So I, I think people are the same. If uh, they get a sense of who this guy is and why he did it, they're, they're, they're going to feel better in the, in the long run, having an answer, uh, uh, having an answer to that, that uh, gives them a sense of safety, whether they should have or not. But, uh, um, but yeah, that may, that certainly may play into it. I'm a producer at heart. That's how I started. And right now I'm thinking I got to do a show with these two guys and I'm putting them both on the spot about okay. like the five most intense cases that they've ever encountered. So I know SDS Nation is going to write in and demand that. And then Agent McCrary is going to have to come back. But for now, let, on them, to the let them know that I have a book about one of my most intense cases. The case. The case. The book, The Case, so. is coming yeah. out. Did I forget to plug that at the top? I will plug you, it on, you the, did, on the. You did not. You, you plugged it at the top. <laughs> Thanks again, man. I appreciate yeah. it. Oh, awesome. Um, so uh, this next comment comes from Haley and Agent McCrary. I picked this for a reason. Uh, right after this, I'm doing another show about this missing woman in Cohasset, Massachusetts. Everything is pointing to the husband. Um, hopefully there's a pleasant ending, but it, it does not appear that way. But this person writes, uh, Amy, who was our guest, makes a valid point to say the interest for women in true crime is to learn from these people's crimes. I was a victim of domestic violence, and now looking back, he was a typical type, loved by everyone outside of my home, to brutally cruel to me indoors. How they switch between the two has since interested me to find out what goes on in their minds. So this is a little off topic for this show, uh, but... Do you have any um, words of wisdom to victims who might find themselves in a domestic violence situation right now? Well, uh, yes. I mean, they need they need to understand it's not going to get better, uh, mm-hmm. that they need to get out of that si- situation as difficult as that may be. It's only going to go downhill. But it, keep in mind, those domestic violence situations are about control, not about love. It's about dominating and having total control uh, over that individual, isolating them, keeping them away from friends and family. And uh, they they have this Jekyll Hyde sort of thing. We talked about, I mentioned the mask of sanity before. It's kind of that thing where they go out in public and, and they can be fine and then come home and just be brutal. And mm-hmm. um, so there are lo- lots of resources out there for battered women and, and uh, uh, people involved in that situation need to assess it, not make excuses for him, not thinking they can make it right if they just behave a little differently. Uh, they, they just need to see what it is and get, get out of that situation. I knew the advice would be strong. A few more comments and then we'll do some closing remarks and uh, call it a wrap. Uh, this next one comes from 
Guava B52 and uh, Detective Anderson, this one will be for you. I think Brian Koberger in the car stop with the police in Indiana gave himself away when he was saying they were going for some Thai food. But then his dad says they just came from Washington. He turns his head, this is Koberger, Brian, and seems to say either I'm done or it's done. It's as though he felt like they had caught up with him. I'm curious because you look at things through a different lens. Did uh, did any of that bubble up for you when you saw some of this body cam footage? You know, uh, that, that trying to get in and, and understand how this man was thinking is, is is part of the job. You know, you don't you you never know what a person is thinking, especially when they're trying to escape. You know, he, he's he's. It's obvious that he's going to make mistakes, and he, which he did. He, he, we've seen that through this entire investigation. So, yeah, listening to some of the words that he says while he's not in the in the box, or I'm sorry, in an interrogation room, yeah, that, that's going to be prevalent in the case. It's going to help investigators throughout the, this entire investigation. Uh, Agent McCrary, to you, I thought this was interesting. Uh, I asked you about the situational awareness I'm intrigued by that. This is from Kyle in Oklahoma. It's a little long, but bear with me for a second. I do believe there are some commonalities with those of us who hunt. This is a hunter here hmm. who go out three to four weeks before hoping to get eyes on that trophy buck. Then we stalk for weeks until the season starts and we can legally in all caps, go get that trophy and fill my freezer on the side. Anyway, I have about 30 kids who I volunteer I teach them situational situational awareness, firearm safety, how to draw as fast and safe as possible, uh, and self-defense as well. My kids have been taught all their life. Number one, get a motion detector with a light and camera. Two, add to the list of chores that two people will seal all doors, windows each night. One person might get lazy. Three, uh, signs telling passersby that you have cameras and alarm. Do you have any other advice about how people can stay safe in their homes? There are a lot of people that wrote in saying now they're you know locking their doors or extra fearful because it's such a seemingly random attack, even though it might be targeted. But just curious uh, if you can right. appease the audience at all. Well, I, I, I think just being reasonable, not getting paranoid, not going crazy about this stuff, but being reasonable uh, in your safety is, is probably all you need. The, the chance of this happening is so rare that someone's going to come in and do this. Uh, the reality is, and I don't know if this is comforting or not, we're much more likely to be assaulted or killed by someone we know than someone we don't know. Uh, stranger stranger danger is what we're all afraid of, the boogeyman coming in at night and, and you know doing something horrible. Mm -hmm. But going back to the previous question, you're much more likely people are much more likely to be involved in a domestic violence situation or altercation with people they know. I mean, if you think about it, it makes sense. Why does somebody hurt somebody else? Well, because there's a beef between them. There's some kind of an issue, and uh, that that's the reality. So guarding against stranger coming in, that's fine. Just be reasonable in what you do, and don't don't drive yourself crazy being overly paranoid, but just be, be smart. Uh, like I say, the being tough on crime is one thing, but let's be smart. Let's be smart on crime, and, and uh, um, that's the best way to approach it, I think. Next one is from uh, Marianne and uh, Chris. This one I'll toss to you. Um, I believe the father did not know that his son murdered four students. Um, a lot of people are questioning that. I'm just wondering if you have a gut instinct one way or the other. Uh, he may have known about these writings from 14 to 17. Any thoughts? He, he may have known about the writings, but uh, I'll ask, I'll, I'll pose this question to you. Could you ever see your children, any of your children, committing a murder of four different people? I know I couldn't. I, I, I couldn't see any of my children committing that murder. So it, uh, I'm, I'm almost, I, I feel pretty comfortable in saying that I know. I don't think the father knew that his son had committed these murders. Uh, if he did, he would have taken steps way before he was arrested to get him out of town, or if he was planning on helping him, or he would have turned him in. Uh, you know, so. No, I don't. I don't think that he he knew about it, uh, um, and I and I don't think that many parents could would would admit that they could see their children committing a, a murder such as this. And a final comment before closing remarks uh, to 
to Agent McCrary. Uh, this comes from Jane, and I can't make out the rest of the name. And she writes, Koberger will never plea. He lives for the attention. He will revel in each minute in court 100%. Agree or disagree? Uh, he will plea if he thinks he's gotten a deal. If uh, He's a narcissistic guy. Um, in, in other words, he thinks he's smarter than everybody else. And if he thinks he's gotten over on the, the government with a plea uh, that he's won, he may, he may plea. Uh, I agree that he may enjoy some of the attention. If there is a trial, he's the kind of guy who will maybe want to try to take the stand and talk his way out of this thing, thinking he can you know, kind of bullshit his way through this thing somehow. Um, of course, his attorney will give him good advice not to do that. Uh, but I, I think he could plea if he thinks he's the one who's done it to them rather than they've done it to him. So it's 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 in that mindset that it's going to make the difference, I think. The man who is Denzel Washington's twin, Detective Sergeant Chris Anderson. He's a retired Birmingham Police Department veteran with 27 years of experience in law enforcement. He was on the show Reasonable Doubt. He was on First 48 Birmingham. He's got his own podcast, The Crime and Cookie Juice Podcast, and he is the author of the upcoming book, The Case. Your final thoughts today, Detective Sergeant. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we, like I said earlier, we hear the words DNA being found in a case. We think that's an automatic slam dunk, and, and it's not. It, it, science is, has, has increased tremendously when it comes to investigations of all sorts, but I don't think that we should rely so much on the science rather than we should rely on the investigation, and this investigation has a, has a little bit more to, to do. So, uh, you know, I think we should all be patient. Be patient with the law enforcement officers, be, pa be patient with the FBI, and let's see how this case turns out before we make a determination as to guilt or innocence. Because if they charge this man, uh, which he he's already been charged, but if they pursue this case without all the information, we could re-victimize the family members of the ones that have lost their children in this case. And that is something that you never want to see. Greg McCrary entered on duty as a special agent with the FBI on December 1st, 1969. He's been associated with the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime since its inception in 85. He's also authored numerous publications, including The Unknown Darkness, Profiling the Predators Among Us, and he was a contributing author to the FBI's Crime Classification Manual. Final thoughts, Agent. I, I agree with Chris and a lot of what he, most everything he said tonight. I uh, can't think of anything. I just dis disagree. Uh, but keep in mind, the investigation is ongoing. Uh, they're going to be timelining him to see if they can put him in other crimes uh, that may have occurred. There may be lesser crimes that he's done. What we find with these guys is we call successive approximation that they may have tried lesser crimes as they're working up to this. Wouldn't surprise me if he's done burglaries, gone in houses, see if he could get in and get out undetected or, or you know, uh, I don't know that he's done a murder prior to this. Couldn't rule it out totally, but uh, I think they'll be looking every place he's been looking for unsolved cases, anything they could do. And then continuing to work this particular case to shore up to get uh, as much evidence as they, they possibly can to get as tight a case as possible. It was a uh, true honor to have both of you, two stars uh, in the law enforcement world. Uh, glad you joined us. Hope you will come back. A quick programming note. We're also following the case of this Cohasset, Massachusetts woman, Anna Walsh. Let's uh, pray and think about her and hope that she will be okay. We will be, at, be back with another episode of Surviving the Survivor. Love you, America. 